colleagues just today i was i was on a ward where where someone was really struggling to to mobilize and and to walk and and engage with the physiotherapies due to pain and and very small incremental doses of morphine helped her actually get back on her feet and then mobilize and get some exercise and start the process of gently rehabbing again and when you put it in that way people worry so much about being addicted to morphine to it making them worse and and sort of a horrible drug that in the media is, is often vilified and portrayed as a very bad drug that's going to make you addicted um actually if if used properly morphine is a fantastic drug that can actually help people in all sorts of situations get back um get back running again get back back to normal again yeah no i agree with you entirely i think jamie's being very harsh i think morphine is the <laughs> ultimate drug in palliative care yes i i think so too and i think i think uh we should we should send jamie to room 101 now we should Gimo, yeah. Gimo, come in please <laughs> well no I, don't, I wouldn't like to come in and defend you jamie but i was going to come in with a with another point was my drug game um, mark in, in was was aspirin for a very similar reason in that it sort of for me aspirin was a drug that, with the history behind it and the right up to the modern day usage that sort of encapsulated a whole profession and i think that's 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 what you're saying i think isn't it is that, it, that that's probably sort of like an ever-present feature of your world that's right and I, I feel i need to protect morphine a bit sometimes as well <laughs> because it gets such a bad press and it, it you know the daily mail headlines of it you know people are really fearful of this drug but it, it's so incredibly useful and the, the double effect as you know in pharmacology is sort of always ascribed with with morphine but i i'm pretty sure i know a few cardiology drugs and a few ke chemotherapeutic agents which have got a stronger double effect i.e good effect versus damaging effect than than i described to morphine i mean it's dangerous is it dangerous drugs or is it dangerous prescribers you know that's that's always the big question isn't it and if like in palliative care the advice is give very small doses of morphine incrementally and according to pain rather than big sloshing doses then that, that works a lot better i think we're all in agreement with that so yeah that's a great drug we'll definitely take morphine i'm allowed that yes excellent. definitely it's yes. not going to do it's not going to do anything for our rating figures though is it morphine it, you know that, there we are. is this true then mark i heard that oxycodone was designed by a german scientist and hitler was on it is that true um yes that's all true yes yeah um but uh yeah, I, I thought there were certain topics we were going to, weren't going to discuss today. <laughs> Sorry. And and the war was one of them. I mean, Jamie promised me at the beginning that no one would mention the war. So um, It was nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> in, Mark's, in, in Mark's rider, it clearly stated, clearly stated. Okay. Sorry, Mark. I just, I heard that okay. story. I apologize for the inconvenience. So, would you also like to offer the oral apothecary a career anthem then, Mark? Yes, I mean, again, very difficult, very changeable when it comes to, to music. And, and that's actually a good link up because I'm going to choose Changes by David Bowie. Because it's, I mean, David Bowie, as, as I've often said, has sort of been a sort of soundtrack to my life to, in a certain degree. I can remember different Bowie songs will evoke different memories. And it was a toss up really uh, between Changes by David Bowie and, and the Changes album, actually, which was one of my first exposures to David Bowie, and some of the tunes by Susie and the Banshee which I'm a big fan of as well. I, I just plumbed for David Bowie because I suppose that's been there since my, my, my early teens and is still there. And of course, there was the big David Bowie letter that went viral. In just answering the question, I suppose, an anthem to your career, I think it said, Changes Bowie is, is, is my choice on this one. Absolutely fun, fantastic tune. You've redeemed yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we mentioned it briefly at the beginning and, and lots of people will hear it. But do you want to briefly talk about your David Bowie story? Yeah, um, it was after uh, David Bowie's uh, death, after that was announced, um, I went to work and I was quite shell-shocked because I'm such a fan and I hadn't expected this. And I think a lot of people hadn't expected this, didn't even realize that he was that unwell. Um, and so lots of people at work were chatting about it and, and a lot of my patients as well. So in Slandock Hospital, I went to one of the wards, met a new patient who'd been diagnosed with quite an advanced cancer. And, you know, it, meeting him for the first time, introducing myself, and then we were chatting away about David Bowie for about 35 minutes and w which tunes we liked and, and what had happened and trying to sort of unpick the radio news that I've, I'd heard and then what she'd heard from the, the nursing staff. And then David Bowie got us chatting about what would happen to her and her cancer. I mentioned that it had sounded like a, David Bowie had died at home and then she said, I'd, I'd quite like to die at home as well. 
and then she talked about her parents' death, and she talked about things that she would want and wouldn't want, and it, it led to so many topics that are usually a sort of second or third conversation for me rather than a first-time conversation, and we, we both sort of remarked on that or reflected on that. Now, I think she was probably a patient who was easy to talk to about those topics anyway, but for some reason, somehow, David Bowie had become our medium to talk about end of life and where she'd want to be and she said she'd prefer to be at home, but would also accept the, the hospice um, as an option. Yeah, so I, I wrote this all down. I had my appraisal was due, so I needed to reflect on something, and I was lacking appraisal stuff in my, my folder. So I wrote this down in a reflective way, and it just grew longer and longer because David Bowie had meant so much to my life and, and other people's lives as well. So And then I watched the, the, the video for Lazarus and Blackstar, and he's writing a letter in it. And so I, th- I just had this, this sort of click moment when I thought, oh, I'll just turn this reflection into a letter. And then it was published on the British Medical Journal Supportive and Palliative Care blog, which, if I'm completely honest, you know, maybe gets 100 hits or so, uh, and not more. And then Marie Curie picked up on it, and the Marie Curie charity uh, tweeted it. Then it got a lot of hits then, because Marie Curie has got a, quite a big reach. And then suddenly on, on my Twitter, everything went completely sort of mad, because the, the letter kept being retweeted and retweeted and retweeted. And uh, David Bowie's son, Duncan Jones, had, had retweeted it. And um, that was his only tweet in days and weeks after his father's death. And then uh, all hell broke loose the next day at work. There was lots of phone calls to the medical director. CNN were calling, ITV, BBC, um, uh, you know, the Nepalese Times. I mean, everyone, uh, El Mundo. I mean, it was it was really mad. And, and uh, they couldn't get hold of me because I was working, basically, and I'd pretty much switched my phone off. And then in the evening, I got back home and <laughs> I knew something was up, basically. <laughs> And, and then I went inside and then there was a pretty much like a minute later, there was a knock on the door and this young lad was there from, from the Daily Mail and I basically told him to bugger off because I don't like the Daily Mail. And it was around that time when the Daily Mail and we're the Sun, there. yeah, the Daily Mail and the Sun were, were posting a lot of really bad stuff about uh, doctors because the junior doctor strike was on and so they were posting pictures of junior doctors uh, from their Facebook accounts drinking champagne on holiday and showing oh yeah look at them and then now they're striking kind of thing so I was I was pretty annoyed with the, the mail and the sun anyway so I just told them politely to go away because he was a young lad obviously it's, it's not his fault that the daily mail is a, it's this bastard rag basically and then he went away but then they still published an article where they wrote, um, Dr. Talbot um, said it was an unusual day, speaking from his uh, porch in the leafy suburb of Poncana. <laughs> they had to get a little jibe in the buckets, <laughs> didn't they? Um, he said today had been an unusual day. Now, I hadn't said that to the reporter at all, but I had spoken to someone at the Wales Online um, and said it had been an unusual day. So they'd clobbered two pieces of information together, one that I said to another reporter that today had been an unusual day. Obviously, I'd spoken to the reporter in my porch, but I told him to bugger off, basically. So they pieced those two together, and then it became this whole article about this letter. So it's, yeah. A bit later, there was a, another knock at the door, and this time it was a taxi driver. And I said, oh, hello, who are you? And <laughs> he had this, I've got this, this taxi gram for you. So I was like, what's a, what's a taxi gram? Wow, I never heard of that. Yeah. I know. I took this piece of paper for, from him and he said, yeah, basically what you can do if you're, if you're somewhere else and you want to deliver a note to someone, you can phone the taxi company, they'll print out a message and then they'll drive it to the address. No way. I'd had lots of missed calls and emails from Good Morning Britain from one of their editors. And there was this print, we've been trying to get hold of you. Would you get into this taxi and come to London so that you can be on Good Morning Britain with Fern or whatever, basically, the next morning? And I, I just looked at the taxi driver and said, yeah, look, it's ridiculous. It's not your fault, but can you tell them no? <laughs> Because I had a busy day the next day and I, yeah, I didn't want to go to London particularly. So that was that. And then lots of people wrote about it. The BBC came to work and they did a, a brief feature about it. And then the really nice thing was that uh, someone got in touch with me via email who runs a program called Letters Live. So it's like a, an event where letters get 
uh, read out by famous people. And I didn't know this at the time. And he said, uh, really love your letter. Um, you know, would, would you read it out? And I said, no, I, I'd, I'd rather not. Uh, it's nice that it's out there, but I don't want to make a big fuss of myself. And I've got stuff to do, basically. And he said, would you mind if one of our, our regular readers reads it out then at this event? And I said, yeah, that's absolutely fine. No problem at all. And I thought that was that. And then a few weeks later, um, this event happens at Freemasons Hall in, in London. And just beforehand, Sean, the organizer, phones me up and said, I've got uh, the, the person who's reading the letter here. He wants to read it, but I'll just check with you that you're right. Um, for him to read it. His name is Travis Cocker. He's uh, He used to play in a band called Pulp, basically. <laughs> and I went, oh, yeah, yeah, I know Travis Cocker. What? He was going to read my letter. Then I was, oh, damn it, I should have gone um, to meet Travis Cocker. But uh, he, he read out the letter. He read it out absolutely beautifully. And I've got the recording of it. And and then I, I, through that, I got to meet Travis Cocker a few, uh, few weeks later. And he said, yeah, Mark, it was really pertinent, this letter, because shortly before I, I read the, that, that letter, I'm you know, my, my father died recently. Recently, and uh, he was in Australia, and I had to deal with issues like DNA CPR, and that was a really p- pertinent part of the Bowie letter for me. So incredible speaking to Jarvis Cocker about this, and and him talking about his his, his dad. And then yet a few weeks later, uh, Sean phones me again, and said this time he's at Hate Festival. Oh, we want to read your letter again. And I said, Oh, who's it this time? And he said, uh, Yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch. Do you know him? He's an actor. <laughs> And I said, yes, I know him. Um, it is, um, uh, uh, well, I'm coming up. So I drove up to Hay Festival, basically, because that's not too far away. And I sat in the front front row, scratching my head as to what had happened. And uh, there's Benedict Cumberbatch reading reading my letter out. And uh, yeah, very, very strange. And so the legend was born. That is a brilliant story. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that is a brilliant story. It shows as well, doesn't it? I think it might not sound like it, but we have put some thought into this in, in this podcast. And, and, and music is really powerful, isn't it? That whole story is based on the connection you have with someone through music i think that's that's brilliant that's that's right and and how how it all linked and, and clicked together that's why we love music and that's why we always ask our guest for a career anthem fantastic story thank you very much for that mark and finally would you like to offer a book perhaps that you think is very thought provoking for our listeners yeah so i didn't read the question particularly well on that one <laughs> and I thought your question had been, what book do you want to sort of share? But n- nothing that sort of necessarily, necessarily had influenced my career. So, but I think you want one that influenced my career, don't you? It's up to you. Or, or you'd recommend to younger clinicians starting out? To younger clinicians starting out. I mean, one that I've talked about during the uh, pandemic which really influenced me and I was I was sort of forced to read this book because I took French at school. It's The Plague by um, Albert Camus and I really didn't want to read this book at all uh, but I read it and I, I, I really loved it and it stayed with me to this day. Um, there's many many different characters but there's a central doctor character, Dr. Rieu is his name and the way he, he, he deals with patients, handles uh, everything is was quite inspirational I found but it also dealt with how other people dealt with the pandemic and with this plague and this town aura going into into isolation into lockdown basically and how people dealt with it and you see all sorts of things coming in religion science faith and 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 also just sheer panic and and fear and d- during this re- really sort of nasty pandemic when when people were dying i actually um i read it again at the start of um covid-19 which is probably you, th- you might think the worst thing you could possibly do but it's it's such a good book and i can really recommend it after i did a little um review of it again on the bmj support of palliative care blog um and at this time it really only got about 89 views or something like that so maybe maybe your oral Apothecary. Hold on, yeah. hold on, hold on tight. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe add a few uh, readers to to this blog. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. So I hope they followed the science in that. By the way. Well, yeah. I mean, you you, you could you could argue about that. The, the, I mean, the science is is obviously um, discussed at at length by Albert Camus, but. He himself isn't a scientist, and you can see a lot of errors uh, within the book. So I'd say he sort of overlook that a little bit, and you know the the way the plague is transmitted, and where it's come from, and how it works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have to be a bit um, a bit tolerant of, of that, but otherwise, it's a fantastic book actually, and it's about occupation basically. I think you got one up on on Matt Hancock because he he um, he said he learned everything he knew about it from Contagion, the film, wasn't it? So. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> he did. 
the, the true narrative of the story, what Alva Camus really meant was this was essentially an occupation. You know, the sort of the, the disease is actually an occupation and it was about, you know, G Germans and Nazi Germany and the occupation and, and those kinds of things. And there's a lot of kind of um, metaphor uh, in that as well. And, and that's why it's an interesting and fascinating uh, book as well. Okay, good. Well, we like our listenership to be stretched. So it's the plague by albert Camus, if i got that right if you may indulge me so because i thought you know what what book would you recommend just recommend to people i'm a big fan of haruki murakami as a japanese author um and he's he's written quite a few many many novels and there's lots to pick from and i i really like most of them 